Welcome to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalden. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. My name is Jonah, and I founded one of Canada's largest microgreens farms, growing over 250,000 microgreen trays in my farming career, and I'm on a mission to help growers and farmers grow more food with less resources and make their farms lean, mean profit machines. On today's AMA, we're going to touch on using biofungicides for Pythium, creating a volunteer program for your farm, shipping microgreens nationally or regionally, and so much more. Let's get right into it. The first question is, can you give me your thoughts on shipping nationally and or regionally? Do you have any recommendations on packaging for shipping product? So most microgreens farms just sell locally, so they don't really uh, generally ship nationally. I know it's becoming, it's starting to become more popular. Um, you know, the more efficient the shipping system or, uh, you know, gets like with Amazon and that sort of thing, it gets easier to uh, ship product um, nationally or regionally. But the challenge is that microgreens are a perishable product. So in, you know, in the, let's say USA and Canada, um, you have kind of two extremes. You have really cold weather in the winter in most of uh, at least Canada and mo and like a good chunk of the United States. And then in uh, the summer months, you have often extreme heat, especially as you get more south uh, in the U.S. So this becomes the challenge of shipping product nationally. Like there's no other reason other than uh, the product going bad and the economics of shipping uh, a lower cost product product. So let's say, you know, you're shipping, um, you know, iPhone cases or whatever, like it's a very small item, it doesn't take up very much space. So you can put it in a very small package or box. Um, and it's not perishable. So the chance of it either breaking and or going bad is very low. So it becomes uh, possible to ship the product uh, nationally, and then even internationally, which is, you know, most of these type of things are made overseas. Um, when it comes to produce, uh, you know, unless you're at mass, mass scale, it becomes quite challenging to uh, ship a perishable product. So, you know, as an example, um, blueberries in the winter months in North America often come from Peru or Chile. Um, so from there, there's planes that fly constantly back and forth to ensure they're actually getting a fresh product. Because if you took blueberries from, you know, I don't even know how far it is, 5,000 kilometers, 10,000 kilometers away, uh, it would take like, you know, 15 to 25 days roughly to get there by boat. Um, so, you know, migraines go bad by then and blueberries would as well. So they airship it. Um, now that's not really practical at a small scale. It may be practical if you're at a large scale. There is a farm in, uh, I believe in San Diego, a very large migraines farm that ships product all the way even to where I live in Canada. Um, and they sell migraines uh, that way. But it's for most people, it's going to be very difficult to do that. So the 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 closest I've seen is a farm called Miko's Micro Farm, which has been on the podcast before, and they mentioned that they ship product nationally, but they also mentioned all the headaches and challenges with it. So while it may be a good strategy um, to increase brand awareness and you know be able to ex expand your scope of market, so instead of just selling to uh, you know your local city, you can sell to a much larger potential audience, which is great. Um, but overcoming the economics and the shipping challenges where I don't know if I'd necessarily recommend it to the average microgreen grower. Um, so what, when it comes to, uh, shipping itself, um, you're going to have to come up with some sort of system of cooling in the summer months, the product to keep it cool. So it doesn't, uh, uh go bad. And then in the winter months to keep it warm enough from freezing because if microgreens freeze, uh, they turn to mush and like, you know, you're not gonna have happy, happy customers. Um, and then the other side is the economics. So if you're shipping, let's say like four or five clamshells of microgreens, that's let's say uh, $25, $30, something like that. Um, you know, if the shipping cost is, you know, 15 or $20 to ship that, um, it, you know, the economics start getting a lot more difficult because then who's bearing that cost? Like for you to bear the extra 15 or $20 in shipping doesn't really make sense because then your profit's kind of, uh, gone. And then uh, if the customer bears it, they're going to be paying a lot more than they can buy locally. So that's where the economic challenge of that comes in. Um, but it's definitely, it's doable. There are farms that are doing it. It's just the scale you need to get at 
uh, to make it work um, is not really practical for most microgreens farms. Next question is, would you mix the seeds uh, for a crop before planting or plant them separately? Um, so it really depends on the seeds you're using. So as a general rule of thumb, I would say don't mix the seeds before planting, plant each variety separately. Uh, the exception of that is if you have varieties that grow at the same speed or very similar. Um, so for example, if you there's, there's certain mustard varieties that grow at similar speed. Uh, so you could potentially mix uh, mustards and then have them grow at the same speed. But if you try to grow like pea shoots and uh, you know amaranth and mustards all in the same tray, uh, first of all, they're gonna grow at different speeds. And then also, uh, some of them are going to grow faster than others, meaning that they're going to get shaded out. So you're going to have uh, like a dominant variety in a mix that's going to grow faster than the rest of the uh, varieties in, in that tray. Uh, and you're going to get uneven growth. Whereas if you grow them separately, they each have their own opportunity to grow at the speed uh, uh, and spacing that they need. And that m creates a much higher quality product, in my opinion. Um, and again, there are a few exceptions to this, but it's pretty rare. So uh, what you really don't want to do is have like, uh, a canopy on top and then a lower canopy of crop because that lower canopy not only won't grow as well, uh, it's going to create a lot more risk for disease. So there is a lot of seed companies that sell mixes that I personally would never grow because they're they're not going to be um, growing at the same speed. So if you take a bunch of kales and mix them together, that should grow at the same speed. If you take a bunch of uh, mustards and mix them together that should grow at the same speed but if you take a bunch of different varieties and mix them together you're generally not going to have good results so if you're uh finding you're having trouble with with growing multiple varieties of seeds together it's much easier to just split them apart grow them separately and then mix them together after um after you harvest do you use a bottom tray with holes when you stack for germination then add the bottom tray when they go under lights or use the bottom tray right away so this is a good question uh, generally speaking, there's not going to be a big difference between the two, but there is some small advantages to uh, not using the bottom tray without holes right away. Uh, so the main advantage is uh, you'll keep things cleaner. So if you put the bottom tray right away and then stack them, you're going to get seed and or vermiculite or soil on the underside of that tray. Um, and then that, when you put them on the racks, are going to drop on the level below potentially as they dry out. Whereas if you... Uh, just put the trays with holes and stack those. Then when you when you start bottom watering them, when they go under lights, you put that in the in the bottom tray without holes and that tray is clean um, at the bottom. So there's gonna be less of a mess. Um, so that's the first thing. And then there, I guess, would be a slight advantage in airflow because the trays with holes have, you know, small pockets of potential extra air that can get into uh, the, germ the germinating seeds and give a little more airflow. Pretty minor difference, but I think the more one is just keeps things cleaner. Next question is, do you recommend using biofungicides? Um, this is a, a, a question coming in good timing. I actually visited a uh, very large farm that uh, actually uses biofungicides. Um, they're a certified organic farm and they use it as pretty much an insurance policy against Pythium. So with microgreens, the main disease you're gonna face is Pythium, also known as dampening off. And uh, the main way to tackle that is by disinfecting your trays properly. And I've done uh, other Q and A's where I've, I've touched on that. So definitely feel free to check that out if you're not sure how to best disinfect your trays. Um, but uh, I think he had a good approach to this where like you don't wanna rely on biofungicides to prevent Pythium because um, it, it's just not gonna be 100% effective or even 95% effective the way that disinfecting your trays would be. Uh, but they are something that may be worth incorporating um, to prevent or as an insurance policy to prevent Pythium from spreading. So it's not going to uh, eliminate it. It's not going to uh, completely fix a problem if you have it, but it is a, a tool in the toolbox to manage Pythium. Um, and then in terms of what I'd recommend. So I used to use something called um, a tri like it was a trichoderma species uh, that grows naturally on, on coconut. Uh, on coconuts. So, uh, and that was something that was commonly used in the industry at the time. I added it to the soil when I planted. It was uh, a, a, also a, bungo, a biofungicide made from a fungus, <laughs> which is kind of ironic, uh, but it would attack uh, Pythium in the soil. Now I found it didn't really work that well in my you know honest opinion. So I stopped using it 
pretty early on, maybe like a few months after trying it, because I just found it didn't really help much. Um, but the farm I visited, they use something called EM1, uh, which is like a, a Japanese uh, cultured bacillus, I believe it's called, or bactillus bacteria. Um, and it's quite effective at keeping a good microbiome in the soil and preventing Pythium from taking over. Again, it's more of a, a, a preventative insurance policy rather than uh, this is going to get rid of uh, a Pythium outbreak that you have. So that that's a pretty common one. And um, so that, that's what I would recommend. It's cool because you can kind of brew it yourself. So you can buy a concentrate of this uh, Bacillus bacteria and then uh, brew it and then add it to your watering when you water your crops. Having said that, um, I, like I said, prevention uh, with disinfection is the best way to go about. And then this would just be a way to prevent outbreaks from happening and reduce the risk that Pythium will spread in your uh, in your crop system. What can I do to get my crops drier? I don't think I'm overwatering and they're close to wilting. So uh, if they're close to wilting, uh, then your issue is not necessarily that you're uh, watering. It's not necessarily a watering issue. It's probably more so a uh, seed density issue. So a lot of the Facebook groups say to plant like broccoli at 30 grams, 35 grams, as an example. Um, if you plant at that uh, density, even having fans blowing directly on the crops will not be able to penetrate the, the, the density of seeds that are planted. So um, you either have to you know, uh, lower humidity in your room plus add fans uh, would be maybe the first test I would do if you don't want to change your seeding rate. Or uh, another option would be to reduce your seeding rate so that um, you have less density. Or you could do a combination of that and see what works best. Uh, but you know, having lower humidity means that you're going to have less uh, humid air in the room. And then when you have a fan blowing, it's blowing drier air. So when that drier air mixes with the humid air that's uh, in your crop canopy, it'll even out. So the drier the air in your space, obviously to a certain limit, you don't want it to be like 0% humidity. Uh, but if it's like 35 40% and it blows on the crop and in that canopy it's probably close to 100 percent, if not 100 percent. that's why it's condensating on the leaves uh then it's going to mix that air and get it drier and get that humid air out of the canopy um so that's what I, that's what i'd uh, recommend i don't think if your crops are wilting then you're not overwatering. um as you said you don't think you're overwatering, which I don't, I don't think you are either um i think you just need to adjust your fan humidity and or your seeding rate to get the correct density to prevent uh, condensation from forming on the leaves in the first place. Next question, when is the right time to add volunteers to a microgreens farm? I find part-time workers to be tricky on getting efficient workers for one to two harvest, harvest days a week. And then uh, uh, I'm harvesting 300 trays on Monday and another 150 for two other markets later that week. So uh, first of all, congratulations on being able to produce that much product. I think that's that's great. And, um, and that means you're moving uh, in the right direction. Uh, as you scale your microgreens farm, you're gonna have different issues pop up. So production becomes less of an issue and then um, managing staff or the, that side of production of managing people uh, becomes an issue, making sure you have enough staff and the staff are well-trained and they're doing uh, work well um, so that you can focus on building the business, getting sales, checking in with customers, that sort of thing. Uh, and then planning for the future with automation and other sort of things that reduce the total cost of production. Uh, but having said that, um, volunteers are, uh, they're useful in, in certain ways. Like I think you could build community with volunteers, which is really great if that's something that's part of uh, what you want to do with your farm. And they can help alleviate some of the bottlenecks. Mostly uh, uh, harvest days are usually the biggest bottleneck with microgreens farms. Sometimes it can be planting days. Um, or, you know, if you go to markets, then probably farmer's markets might be your bottleneck, like the time it takes to go there. Um, but generally speaking, harvest days are the biggest bottlenecks. Um, and then volunteers can be useful in that process, but you have to consider that there is a, a time commitment to manage uh, a volunteer program. So I had a volunteer program at Living Earth that I think was, was really great. Um, we had a good balance of giving value to the volunteers and then getting value back in help in uh, packaging the greens, because that for us was the biggest bottleneck. When you're doing like thousands of clamshells, um, you know, it can be very time consuming. So generally speaking, you're better off to hire employees because they will be more reliable. So in my experience, you, you'll, you'll often get, you know, some great volunteers 
um, but they come and go. And then in between that, you have volunteers that come once, uh, that come a couple of times, that come for two or three weeks, and then they're off doing their, their next thing because they're volunteers. You can't expect them to um, to be like an employee where they're going to show up every week on time, uh, no matter what. Like they're you know they're they're not paid. They're they're volunteer. Uh, I think you know in and of itself, having a volunteer program is is great because it it can help alleviate those bottlenecks. Like I said, uh, but I wouldn't rely on that uh, to manage your harvest days. I would hire employees. And yes, part-time employees are definitely more tricky uh, than hiring full-time employees because full-time employees, that's their full-time work. Like they're there five days a week or four days a week, whatever it is. Whereas part-time workers, they may have another job. Uh, they may not stay as long because you know if it's part-time, it depends on the situation. So I think it's important um, to make sure you're hiring the right people for the job. So if there's like someone that's that, you know, you're in an interview and as an example, someone's like, Hey, yeah, I'm going to go back to school in like three months. Uh, you know, I don't know if I'm still going to have this job. I just looking for a summer job. It, pro in my opinion, it probably doesn't make sense to spend your time and effort to train them and then have them leave in a short period of time. So volunteers are that to the extreme, whereas, uh, you know, there's no commitment at all. So a full-time employee has the biggest commitment. That's their full-time career. Uh, for the time being or job, uh, part-time employee might be that they're in school or they're retired or uh, they have like multiple part-time jobs. Um, so their commitment to uh, helping you run the business is, uh, you know, smaller. And then a volunteer is on the extreme end of that. Uh, you know, they're they're probably there to learn something. They want to learn. They're interested in microgreens or farming or vertical farming, whatever it is. But uh, they have the least commitment. So you have to remember that you're putting your time in to train people. Uh, what is that time worth? That time, in my opinion, is worth a lot. As the business owner, uh, you need to value your time correctly. And if you're training people and they're you know, coming and going all the time, then you need to reevaluate how you're hiring people or how you're uh, recruiting volunteers for your farm. So coming back to the original question is, when is the right time to add volunteers to a microgreens farm? And I think at any point you can you can add volunteers uh, as long as there's, there's you know work to be done and you can find a way to create value. So the way... Um, we would create value is I gave people almost like on in a, in a consulting way, um, people can access anything they wanted to know about the farm. I was very open book and I would open up and be like, Hey, like ask me anything about the farm, how I built it, you know, how the, you know, financials work, like whatever. Like I was, I was very open book uh, and willing to share that. So they had value on that front. And then on the other front, we would always give uh, our volunteers a uh, ma massive amount of microgreens to take home. Sometimes people took like, you know, like literal garbage bags full of microgreens, which is so crazy to say. But when you have a large scale farm, uh, there are times that you have a good amount of leftover product, especially with things like pea shoots. So having said that, um, I think any time is good to add a volunteer program. You just have to be very aware and cognizant uh, of, of why you're adding them to the farm and how uh, you can create a good balance of value flowing both ways and then making sure that it makes sense to actually have volunteers versus hiring workers, uh, you know, as an example, if you have a neighbor that's like super interested and they're, you know, they have lots of free time and they're retired or something like that and they just want to help out, you know, that's an ideal candidate for for a volunteer where like, you know, it's easy for them, it's easy for you and it, and it actually helps out. Whereas if you have a volunteer that, you know, maybe just finished school, is looking for a job, uh, but they just want something to do in the meantime, they're probably most likely not going to stay for very long because uh, unless you can offer them a job um because that's what they're looking for so uh just you know be aware of you know who you're bringing in why they're coming to the farm uh, and that will allow you to make better decisions on hiring people but also adding volunteers to your migraines farm next question i'm thinking about buying a large house or apartment building do you think migraines are more profitable per square foot than uh having renters so i in my opinion, I think these are two separate uh, business decisions. So uh, if you're buying a, a house or apartment building, um, you have to consider like, what would it cost to rent a space uh, if you needed a space to rent to grow microgreens? Uh, and then how much you can make growing microgreens versus buying the space and then renting it uh, as like more of a passive income kind of thing. I, I generally don't think of things in, in this capacity because it's very hard to compare. Like, just one for one, obviously, microgreens are going to be more profitable uh, because, you know, you can grow 
in six square feet, you can grow a ton of, of product and be able to sell it. But it's more so like, how much time do you have? You know, if you buy a house or apartment building and then you just rent it out, it's, it's not passive, but it's pretty close to passive. Like if something breaks in there, you got to fix it. But generally speaking, like, uh, you, there's not much work involved. Whereas running a migraines business is, is a, a, a daily business you need to run. So yes, it is more profitable for sure than renting that, that space. But having said that, cause like, you know, let's say you buy a property for half a million dollars and you rent it for $3,000 a month. Uh, you know, you can make a lot more than $3,000 a month in a whole house or apartment building growing microgreens. So, you know, but you're spending a lot of time doing that. So it's not really a fair comparison. I often get asked a similar question where it's like, should I invest in solar panels uh, for my microgreens farm? So I don't have to, uh, you know, pay for electricity bills. Um, so it's the same thing where it's like, that's an investment, uh, getting solar uh, panels installed on your home or, or business or whatever, that's in and of itself a separate investment than growing microgreens as a business. So um, I would think of it as, okay, like how much, what's the return on, uh, you know, renting this out to renters? Like what, what am I going to get as a return on this investment versus, um, you know, putting that money elsewhere? That's the better way to think of it. So it's like a fair comparison is like, should I, uh, you know, buy the soil mixing equipment that will allow me to seed my or fill my flats like twice as fast? Or should I invest in solar panels that will um, allow me to have lower electricity bills? And then you see like, okay, this is going to like the for the for the soil mixer, it's going to save me X amount of hours valued at this uh, hourly rate. And then the uh, elect the solar panels will save me this much money in electricity bills over this period of time, like which one makes more sense to you. Like that's a fair comparison of like, where should you deploy capital rather than should you, should you start a microgreens business versus uh, rent that space to renters? Cause those are so different. Uh, like they're like apples and oranges. It's very hard to compare them. Um, so hope that helps. Next question. Can you go over the blackout process? Which seeds need blackout and the best way to blackout? Do you use a dome or what do you recommend? So generally speaking, I don't recommend uh, doing blackout unless it's a crop that doesn't naturally stretch enough to like during the growing cycle under lights. Um, and really the only two I've found that have that issue are basil and arugula. Every other migraine seed I've grown naturally will stretch on its own during the growing cycle under lights. So they don't need blackout. Uh, domes, uh, all that kind of stuff is not needed. Um, all you need to do for a blackout is keep the trays stacked. So the, even though like there's weight on them, they'll still extend the stems. They just may be a little bit sideways at first, but then they'll straighten out as uh, they get that weight um, taken off them and put under lights. Now, the reason I don't recommend blackout is because um, you want to have the best quality product in, uh, that you possibly can grow. And if you have blackout, uh, you're taking more time towards growing the stems and less time towards growing the leaves. So the leaves only grow from the light. So uh, you'll, the leaves will grow, they'll, they'll be yellow, you know, in, in, in blackout. Um, and then when you put them under lights, uh, they'll start turning green, but they won't turn green unless you have light. So the light is the factor that determines how much energy the plant uh, can absorb and therefore how much nutrition uh, the plant can absorb from the soil, therefore determining how nutritious the product is when you harvest it. So the longer they're under lights and the less they're under blackout, the more nutritious they're going to be all else equal. Um, so a lot of farms use blackout. I really don't recommend it. Having longer stems and smaller leaves may increase your weight of your product when you harvest uh, for certain crops, but at the expense of the quality. And we're selling food here. So we're not selling, uh, you know, like gizmos or gadgets uh, manufactured in, in like a large scale facility that people are focused solely on price. This is a, a product that people are going to rebuy because it tastes good. So the more nutrition it has, the larger the leaves, the more crunchy it's going to be, the better it's going to taste, the more complex the flavor profile. Um, so the more you have blackout, the less you have of that. Uh, so that's why I don't recommend blackout unless it's necessary for crops um, like basil and arugula. So last question here, any advice on getting UPC codes for retail labels? Yeah, so there is a uh, system, I can't remember exactly what it's called on the top of my head, but there is like a, UP, uh, a UPC code system 
Um, so, you know, when you, when you buy a product that has a barcode, so like, you know, these staples have a barcode and this number is unique to that company. So no one else can purchase that uh, unique number, which indicates what those bars, the, the thickness of the bars, uh, meaning like how, how the computer system will read it. So for retail labels, you have to have your, your own unique uh, UPC codes. Because if you have uh, another UPC code, you never like, or if you just like Google's images of UPC codes and put them on your product, it, it, it's very possible that another product may have that. And it can be very confusing, especially if you ever plan on selling online to online retailers, uh, it can get uh, very confusing and will end up costing you a lot more than it saves. Um, so you, some, some places allow you to like rent the code. Uh, and then you pay like an annual fee. I'm personally not a big fan of that. I'd much prefer to buy the code outright and then just own the code indefinitely. And that way, um, you know, there's a one-time fee and then you don't have to worry about it ever again. And generally speaking, like they're not that much more expensive than the yearly fee. So I use a website called buyabarcode.com uh, and that website lets you actually buy them and get your own unique UPC codes. And then uh, you have them, you can download them, and then you can add them to your labels. Um, and then you have them and that's it. So pretty simple. Uh, that's where I'd recommend. They usually always sales on for that sort of thing. So um, you can usually get them discounted. And then the more you buy, so let's say you have three products, it'll be cheaper per label than if you buy one uh, code. So if you have like 10 retail microgreen products, then you can buy 10 and it'll be less expensive per UBC code than buying just one. So. Hope that helps and hope you guys enjoyed this Q&A today and we'll see you on in the next one. Thanks for tuning in to the Mike Regan's Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your Mike Regan's business, visit MikeRegansConsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of Mike Regan's businesses and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Mike Regan's Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share Mike Regan's magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.